Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. Our broadcast today comes from the most recent Meta Strategy Digital Symposium, and the topic was design thinking and ecosystem business models. The panelists who spoke about the topic were Michael Newcity, the Chief Innovation Officer of ArcBest and President of ArcBest Technologies, and Rob Krugman, the Chief Digital Officer of Broadridge. The gentleman who led the conversation was Meta Strategy partner and West Coast lead, Chris Davis. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I'm joined by two folks with really interesting perspectives. Michael Newcity, the Chief Innovation Officer of ArcBest and President of ArcBest Technologies, and Rob Krugman, the Chief Digital Officer of Broadridge Financial Solutions. Michael and Rob, welcome. Hello. Hi, Chris. So ArcBest is a $5 billion company that focuses on freight, transportation, and logistics network. Broadridge Financial Solutions is a $5 billion company that enables financial broker dealers to run their businesses, whether it's clearing trades or distributing regulatory communications with investors and regulatory bodies. So what's interesting about both of these business models is that it provides a network capability for their customers to connect with others. There are many different personas. There are many different constituents. And a lot of innovation that we've seen it has come in the consumer experience, um, chat GPT and, and many of the other things. And both for, for Michael and Rob, there's a need to drive innovation behind the scenes in a B2B environment. And, and I would argue that, that Michael and Rob in some cases driving an innovation mindset for organizations that really have to compete on operational excellence is a tall task. And you, you both also have the benefit of being at your organizations for over 10 years. So you've had the chance to drive transformation over a long stretch. So the topic that we're going to be discussing today is around how do you use design thinking to build your innovation practice in businesses like these that are ecosystem business models. And Michael, I'd love to maybe start with you you were at the organization prior to your current role. You actually had a role as a CFO. And I'm curious, what was the spark that, that drove you to say, we really need to bring design thinking as a mechanism and a practice to drive innovation at our best? Yeah, I think what's really interesting here is, uh, you know, the, the sequence of these conversations, um, you know, we're really moving something very broad Um uh, and strategic and getting into something a little bit more tactical, which is really fascinating for me. But I think about the pace of change in our industry uh, and the scale of that has not really seen that level of change. I think since our industry was deregulated in the 1980s, you've got uh, a lot of change elements, the, the tremendous amount of uh, technology and innovation investment that's happening really from non-traditionals in our space. You know, we're a hundred year old company and we're seeing uh, uh, startups in our space that have only been in existence in the last five to 10 years. Um, the emerging tech landscape, we just had a discussion about generative AI. Well, there's a lot of that going on in terms of how fast those technologies are emerging. Um, and then customer demands, there's a lot of changing customer demands in this, but you take all that complexity and the number of com uh, elements of complexity, and you've got to have a framework to really uh, sift through that. And what I'd say is design thinking uh, is a framework that has tools and processes and techniques that can uh, really take these complex and dynamic changes and make sense to create direction, strategy, and opportunity. The last thing I'd say on that is that what's core to design thinking is this aspect of empathy and listening, understanding needs, and that's that core is very aligned to ArcBest. ArcBest is a listening organization. We really listen to our customers, but that includes both listening to what they're saying and actually what they're not saying. And, and so it's that deep listening to uncover those unsaid needs and to really make sense of what's happening across all this complexity, whether it's locally, globally, tech related or not. Yeah, I, I love that. And Rob, to turn it over to you, Broadridge was a spin out of ADP in the 2000s. What was it that, that you were listening to your customers, the market that said, this is a problem space that A, needs to grow within ADP? And then what was the carve out mentality? And then how have you sort of perpetuated that cycle of innovation when you don't necessarily have that same ability to, to, to fish in the barrel of the existing ADP client set? What was, what was the genesis that said, 
this is a big enough problem space that we need dedicated innovation and focus to run as an independent entity. First off, I we spun off of ADP before I got here, so um, I wasn't part of that exercise. But let's talk about what it is we do from an innovation perspective. So Broadridge really serves the needs of broker dealers, wealth managers, asset managers across the globe. We have, we work with just about every single major provider in that area, every bank broker that are that work in that space. And when we think about innovation, you know, this is a market that you know the term fintech really wasn't used seven or eight years ago. It's become this term where you hear all over the place. And there's reg tech and there's insure tech. There's a bunch of different techs that are available. And you know, when we think about it, as Michael said, there's a lot of new entrants in the space, right? There's new types of organizations that provide brokerage type services or banking services. There's um, the emergence of digital assets and crypto is a, a very big thing. AI per the last conversation is going to have a dramatic effect. So when we think about innovation and kind of putting that design thinking lens on it, we think about it really from two perspectives. The first is um, our clients are other businesses, but really to solve their problems, what we found is we need to understand the problems that they are customers, right? We facilitate communications for a lot of these organizations. We provide back office services and clearing services. And really what it comes down to is if we can solve the needs of that end customer, our client's customer, the likelihood of us being correct is more likely than not. Right. And so if we start there and work our way backwards, understand the value propositions that we're solving for, the value proposition of that end customer tends to be the value proposition of our client. If there's other intermediaries in the middle and then back to Broadridge, we're all generating value. And we have a much better understanding of how to actually present and tell that story around value, which is really important. So one is kind of that kind of maybe backwards thinking, um, kind of starting with the end customer, even though you're a B2B organization. The other thing is really keeping on top of the emerging technology that's out there and right, building that ecosystem and community. So, you know, I probably meet with VC firms once every two weeks or so just to see what they're investing in, what areas are hot, why they're hot, where do we think these applications are going to be able to provide? And then we do hypotheticals, right? Where, you know, what do we think this technology is going to be used for? What's the effect on blockchain across financial services? Well, if you're asking me, I think it's going to be very significant. What's the effect of artificial intelligence on asset management and portfolio managers? That's a really interesting question. And so we've been challenging ourselves with these questions and then tying in that end user, that customer's perspective to try to get to the right answers. Yeah, I think what's, what's really interesting in, and I would argue maybe both of your industries, whether it's transportation, where there's a lot made of autonomous driving, um, automating a, as much of the supply chain as possible, what in financial services, whether it's robo-advising, and some of the other advanced models that are available uh, for, for automating the transaction workflow that exists, is there's this tension of introducing new technology that for some people might view it as a threat and others are going to run towards it as a, as a clear marker of competitive advantage, operational efficiency. The co-pilot is going to augment my life and is going to make me easier and, and, and have more time to spend with my family. And so there's this really inherent tension. And at the same time, what, where I think design thinking is a relevant topic to follow our, our prior two ones is there's a there's an opportunity or a risk perhaps that people can run towards a solution. Uh, AI is going to analyze which lanes are most productive, predict that a trucker is going to deadhead from Dallas to Houston, and therefore I'm going to prompt him with this new load right before he gets there, and and that might be the right thing to do, but solving it doesn't always start there. So I, I would love Michael for you. Talk us through your, your practice, your design thinking innovation practice. You mentioned that you start with listening. How does the organization take that and resist that urge to just jump straight to a solution and work through that, that process to, to come up with something that's truly viable that you can take to market? Yeah, I think a couple of things there I'd say. I think, you know, the challenge for us or for anyone is that, you know, the everyday business the performance engine of any company, whether it's you know, what's earning revenue and profits today, you know, that model is highly tuned. It follows a tactical regimen and it's, and it's generally based on short-term KPIs, right? And so innovation, whether it's disruptive, large or small, incremental, it requires you to step back from that and be willing to run some experiments that will likely counter that existing revenue generation model. And it's going to require, you know, it requires patience. It requires a willingness to challenge the things that you may hold dear 
to how things are currently done, whether that's something small or large. You know, what we do is we look at our total innovation tech spend, and we've got a kind of a, a good handle on well, how much of that's just run the business. So how much of that's just dedicated toward earning that next dollar of revenue, okay? Everything beyond that is discretionary. And we take those dollars and we really put them into a portfolio of uh, tech or tech and or innovation initiatives. Those project sponsors, they've got to develop an ROI hypothesis or a thesis. They've got to think about uh, the teams, um, the, the, the timing, the, all those tactical things. They've got to have executive sponsorship. And they put those ideas forward in a kind of in a package and they put those forward uh, to a, an investment committee. What that does, it allows our teams that are, are you know, today focused on that, that day-to-day revenue generation, have the opportunity to scale up. Of course, that involves uh, a lot of design thinking. That might involve design thinking in the process of putting that plan together, that innovation plan together. And once approved, a lot of design thinking comes into play in advancing that initiative. Yeah, I love that. And, and Rob, I want to come back to you. You mentioned a lot of your innovation practice starts with understanding your customer's customer. Yep. And, and I really want to make sure in this conversation, we're leaving the audience with, with tangible things that they can put into practice. And I'm curious, how do you go about doing that? Are you doing customer interviews? Are you sourcing that with surveys? Do you have a user research team? Can you talk to us about like how you mechanically go about getting the voice of the end customer, validating that, and then pulling it into your innovation cycle? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to kind of build off of what Michael said, because I wholeheartedly agree with almost everything that he just went through. I think that, you know, what's really interesting about innovation in, in my, and it's hard to just put it into two buckets, but I'm going to try to. There's what I call sustainable innovation, and then there's disruptive innovation. In, it, it's my perspective that sustainable innovation is the responsibility of the product organization, right? They should be thinking about their products and they should be creating strategies and approaches so that they can remain relevant for as long as possible. But you know what, as Michael hit on, one of the biggest challenges you have in any type of established business is disruptive innovation, right? Because it's really hard to tell someone that runs a billion dollar p l that, you know what, I don't think that business is going to be here in five years. And I think if you read your Christensen, for example, right, and, and the innovator's dilemma, there is no business on earth that has been able to escape that premise, right? The companies that have been good have actually recognized it and they always look at customers and they always push the envelope and they're always willing to disrupt themselves. The companies that are strong for a period of time and then eventually go away typically don't disrupt themselves. So how do you actually start to look and how do you avoid the hype cycle, right? There's AI as a new technology. We need to create a hundred person team and work on AI. Well, it starts with asking the right questions. And for us, it really is around research. We want to go and talk to people, right? We want to talk to, so in our industry, it could be, you know, investors, it could be banking customers, it could be any group of folks that we just want to go and talk to and understand the challenges they face in their day to day. Because when we speak to our clients and only our clients, we hear very different answers. They're usually operational answers. There's usually efficiency challenges. But when you go and speak to the end user, they don't care about any of that stuff. They care about, in almost all cases, themselves, right? So how do you enable them to thrive and to be able to get an experience that's tailored to their particular needs? And when you start there, and then you actually make the case for why we want to actually focus on this particular area, it becomes a lot more obvious because you actually, you're actually you solving a problem. So when we think about an idea, we actually try to start with a question versus an idea, right? Because ideas tend to be the loudest guy in the room, right? Questions are... Can we do this, right? Can we take AI and apply it in these areas? Well, let's go figure it out. And what we want to do as quickly as possible is come up with an answer that says, that's a good idea or it's a bad idea, or it's something we should be doing or something that we should leave for someone else to do. If you can get to that answer in 60 to 90 days, it avoids really bad things happening, right? Because we're, we've all been part of businesses where you build a system for 10 or $20 million and you're like, huh. Why didn't this sell? Well, because the premise was a bad idea. It was the loudest person in the room said, we should add this widget because it's going to make every... Well, no, it's not. So doing that constant iteration and not being scared of failure, but 
building the ability to do it as quickly and cheaply as possible of what this is all about. You don't want to make a $10 million mistake. What you want to do is you want to get to know in $200,000. And then the next step is you want to create a proof of concept and then test that and validate it and make sure it's correct. Get a few design partners. So you keep iterating, iterating this experience until you have something that you can be pretty confident is the right thing. And then it becomes a question of what's the go to market, right? Is it going to be a new product for an existing business? Is it going to be a new business? Is this something that's a really good idea that we shouldn't be doing because it doesn't fit into our network ecosystem and we maybe we should launch it as a new business completely by itself? So that's kind of the process and the way that we think about it. And again, it's iteration, 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 all based upon validation. Yeah, I love that. And Michael, just to build on what Rob had, had just uh, talked about, making that decision of when you do a carve out, when you create a business within a business, you're also, in addition to being chief innovation officer, you're president of ArcBest Technologies. Can you talk a little bit about the rationale for dedicating that as, a, as its own space in ArcBest Technologies and what it does and maybe how it operates within the company, but also uh, it collaborates across its, your own ecosystem? Yeah, when I, mean, I think about ArcBest Technologies, you know, we, we it's interesting about, it. It's, it really speaks to our history, Chris. And, and by the way, I just wanna say, uh, all the comments Rob had on the iterative process, I could not agree more. Uh, I just wanted to just echo that, that it's, it, I don't care if you're a startup or you're an established organization, you can um, look at things like quantum computing or generative AI and actually run experiments, iteration exercises, uh, cost effective and try to figure out uh, uh, you shouldn't be afraid to tackle some of these emerging tech landscapes and really trying to figure that out. But, you know, we are, our, our, our best has always been a very curious organization, a very curious company, uh, a lot of focus on innovative thinking. When we first launched our uh, really just our kind of our IT department, if you will, back in the sixties, the idea is that we would never use all the mainframe computing power uh, that we were about to acquire. And so we actually launched a wholly owned subsidiary. Um, it wasn't called ArcBest Technologies at the time. And, but over the course of many decades, the needs of the, of the core business um, became great where, where that group really just focused on, on the business operations versus servicing outside customers, outside of ArcBest Technologies. But we've learned the last decade that we had to take some of those elements within our technologies group and move them from the, the back office to the front office. And we, we did that through new roles. We did that through new processes. We looked at other areas like engineering and R&D and data science. Um, and we said, we need to have those established areas uh, within ArcBest Technologies. So, so when you look at that group today, it's just not IT, it's an R&D function. It's a data science function, it's a project management function, and it's this innovation function, all housed together, very tightly linked, not only to the strategy of the organization, okay, but also to these incremental innovation projects, whether those are disruptive, big, big projects where you're, you're creating a team that you're kind of launching outside of the performance engine of the company, or it's these more incremental innovation projects that are that are helping you with the processes and systems you currently have in place for that next dollar revenue. That's been a huge focus for us uh, really in the last decade because of all the things I just previously mentioned. Rob, turning to you, when you think about innovation within Broadridge, you already spoke to sustainable and disruptive innovation. Sustainable is really the job of the product team and the product manager. How do you think about more broadly speaking on an organizational basis, driving centralized innovation? This is an innovation team. It's an innovation center of excellence. And then when you get that product market fit, or at least you're feeling pretty confident, eventually it's going to have to be deployed to market. It's going to have to live and coexist with the rest of the business. How do you drive that change? Like mechanically, operationally, how do you make sure that the teams are working together so you're getting the outcome because it's not just launch it and it's going to live in its own thing. It's going to live in an ecosystem of products and services with customers that you're already serving. And how do you navigate that change of bringing disruptive innovation into 
the existing way of working? Yeah, you know, this is a bit of a cop out of an answer, but it depends, right? It depends what that disruptive innovation is. If it's, uh, you know, a brand new product where you saw an opportunity. So we're going to say we service thousands of organizations. We're going to take advantage of that network effect to launch this new product. And then we're going to hand it over to an existing business. That's relatively straightforward. You're going to have to teach them. You know, I like the idea of returnships where you include people that are working in the existing business as part of the process, maybe some of the operations people, you know, yeah. I, um, you know, so we can make sure that we are able to kind of continue to make the donuts as we're going forward, right? So that's kind of one side. The other side is disruptive innovation that's going to disrupt an existing business. And this is where I think a lot of organizations have major challenges and we don't escape that. Um, you know, we want to take an existing business. What's the best way to disrupt as an existing business? Is it to have the subject matter experts that work in that business and have worked in that business for a long time come up with a new model? Or is it better to have five people in a room say, hey, we want to completely rethink this? No rules. Let's go and do it. That's kind of a hard answer. It's a hard question to answer. I tend to lean more towards the five people in the room, right? You're going to need your subject matter experts. and You can go and have those conversations and interview them and get the questions that you need. But Often what happens is when you have people that are responsible for operating an existing business, there's a desire for the new way of doing things to look a lot like the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And that can be a real challenge specifically with technology, right? You know, we make a lot of money doing it this way. Why would we change and do it that way, right? And so those things inside an organization become the bureaucracy that, in, in my view, often sees large projects fail. So yeah. is there a way to innovate in a small group, get it to a place where you truly understand the model, you understand the go-to-business model, you understand the technology model, maybe you've built a proof of concept, maybe you have a few customers running on it, and then have that conversation and then bring it back. And it's not an easy answer one way or the other. And I think each use case is going to look a little bit different. But you know, one of the challenges when you try to kumbaya the whole thing, right, where it's going to be overly transparent, is that it ends up becoming a lot more like the old than it should be like the new. And that could actually lead to failure. Yeah, it was interesting that there was a, uh, a YouTube personality who had a, a carriage that used to be pulled by a horse. And then he brings in Spot, the Boston Scientific dog, and Spot now is pulling the carriage. And so you're bringing automation and advanced technology, yeah. but you're not fundamentally changing the process. Yeah. And Spot really struggles pulling a human on a hill. And, and so I think that's definitely a risk of when you're trying to bring that new idea, avoiding the incrementalist trap. Let me just throw a point at you. Like if I look at, if you look at what a Google or an Amazon are going to do, right? They tend to not look at the competition, which is kind of refreshing, right? They may not even look at the existing system they have internally. They really tend to answer one question. Is this good for the end customer? If the answer is yes, they do it. If the answer is no, they don't. And that's a very refreshing approach, right? Because it's not, is this good for the end customer and we'll protect our business over here, right? Because there's a recognition that if it's good for the end customer, yes, it may disrupt that business, but it's silly to think we're the only ones that are ever going to come up with this idea, right? If we're smart enough to think about it, there's a pretty strong likelihood that someone else is going to figure out as well. So let's test these ideas and these concepts. Now, in many cases, the market may not be ready for it, and that's okay as well. But if it is, you'd rather be the driver of that disruption than either play catch up or be disrupted by it. And, and Michael, I want to um, come back to you because ArcBest at its core competes to a certain degree on operational excellence, moving people and freight and goods and, and services. You have a certain degree of rapidity to the business model. When, when you have it really honed well, you can deploy it and you get data and you learn from it. When you need to deploy something new, the risk is it sort of shifts the way that, that people are, are operating today. How do you go about deploying innovation into the field and, and whether it's testing it in one lane, one market, or mm -hmm. rolling it out across not just your own people, but you're in a distribution of, of logistics providers across a wide network. So you can't just change in a vacuum your bill of lading. You need to, to connect with other people across the entire ecosystem. Yeah, I think, you know, I agree with Rob definitely on 
the challenges that you have with the existing operating model. We've seen situations in my career with the organization, seen situations where a great idea, but um, we could have done better on looking at the process, not just the tech. We could have done better on bringing multiple parties into the design stage, innovation stage. And you know, the good thing there is just, that's part of the innovation, right? Maybe in that same book that Rob mentioned, uh, there, the, the failure aspect of innovation is is definitely uh, a learning and a key component. And you you take that and you put that back into the funnel uh, on the process. You know, what we've specifically done in that is there's been initiatives where we've taken a team that is separate and distinct from the operating unit that is looking at this innovation, but we've taken a leader or someone within the operating unit and not just involved them in the team, but actually changed their job where they actually came into that innovation team for a period, six, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and they worked on the problem along with the innovation team, knowing that they were going to go back into the performance engine of the organization and be the change agent. And so we've done, we've done that in some instances. Other times, we've run models where we said we've actually ran the innovation, stood it up, in one part of our operation, you know, the good thing about our organization is that we've got a lot of touch points out there. So we can, we can do uh, A-B testing, if you will, uh, in field and not create a lot of disruption. Okay. So we may take one of our, our asset based service centers, or we may take only one customer or one lane, if you will, and we're able to run that test and then take the results back to the operating unit and say, look, look what happened. And almost as a proof point. Yeah. Those are examples of, of where we've tried to cross that bridge, right? Staying pure to the innovation, not trying to uh, water it down with uh, bias or existing thinking about how the operating model should work and then get that into the, into the operating performance engine for the company. Oh, I love that. And Rob and Michael, what I love about both of your perspectives is it, it's this strong bend towards commercial outcomes and it's innovation for the customer, it's Got innovation it. for the bottom line, and it's not vanity metrics so we could do a yeah. press release. It's real work yes. that's happening day in, yeah. day out for yeah. companies. And I totally. think these insights um, are, are incredibly powerful and very uh, encouraging about the future, especially B2B companies. I think there's so much happening behind the scenes and thank you both so much for, for sharing your great insights with, with the audience today. 